Uh, this is a uh, <laughs> presentation of a collaboration uh, with other people at QRI, oh, <laughs> uh, including uh, yeah, uh, um, Chris Percy, co-author for this paper. Um, OK, so I'm going to be going through a lot of rigorous philosophy, but really, 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 there's one core takeaway, uh, which I'm going to highlight in several ways and give you several ways to develop an intuition pump, which is the connection between resonance and topology and how that may address a lot of philosophical questions in, in, in consciousness, uh, which if you take one thing from this presentation, just that, resonance and topology are related, and then that may answer a lot of questions. Okay, so um, we published this paper in Frontiers uh, last year. It's called, yeah, don't forget the boundary problem, uh, how EM field topology can address the overlooked cousin of the binding problem for consciousness. So just a very quick recap. The binding problem of consciousness is if we're all made of atoms and forces. How is it possible that they can come together to form a unified experience? And our take is that if you start out with that ontology, uh, it's impossible, that this is actually an unsolvable problem. Instead, what you need is a different ontology. Well, we start out with something like the universe is a gigantic field of consciousness. It's just one big thing. And then the question becomes, how do you get boundaries within that one big thing so that I am here, you're here, we're having all of these experiences, how do these kind of like intersubjective boundaries arise within something that start out as being kind of just one thing? Um, we did a literature review on this question. Um, it's not really well formalized in general, except for, for one particular author that I will uh, explain. But uh, famously, I would say like Schrodinger was a, was, was a person who kind of like highlighted a lot of these problems. He's kind of like wondering like, why is it that, you know, kind of like the phenomenal boundary of our experience happens at the level of humans, right? Like, wh why aren't we atoms? Why aren't we, you know, like galaxies? Why, why are we here in this scale? It's very, very puzzling. Um, Rosenberg really formalized it. Uh, he kind of like described it as the chasm between Celia and Charybdis, uh, where Celia is kind of like, yeah, like all of these other subsystems we could be, right? Like cells, you know, like organs. And this is like all of these other mega systems we could also be, like you know, towns or like the human species or something like that. Why are we here? You know, why, why is the boundary of our experience right here? Um, and that leaves, you know, there's a lot of kind of a possible candidate theories and, and approaches. Um, of, of note, here's a resonance theories, um, you know, general resonance theories. I really like Tem Hunt or Asa is around here who work on this stuff. Uh, they also were part of the editing team of the paper, so I'm so, so happy for, for them to be here. Um, but uh, they're not, none of, I mean, they, all of these tend to have oftentimes some kind of problem. I'm not going to go into the details of all of them. Uh, I, I would consider them like pieces of the puzzle, is how I would describe them. Um, the way we formalize the boundary problem more concretely was through these kind of uh, five sub problems. You know, it's kind of, you know, the hard problem of consciousness might be unsolvable, but if you break it down into sub-problems, you can really you know, make conceptual progress. You know, we don't talk about the hard problem of matter <laughs> these days. We've, we talk about electromagnetism and you know, uh, gravity and momentum and things like that. So the boundary problem is like, it sounds very unsolvable, but we think like you can make a lot of progress when you start to really break it down. Um, so this is kind of like the sub-problems we came up with. Um, a very important one, you know, this is a very, very important one, which is like the hard boundary problem. Like, it really does seem, you know, that my subjective experience being here and your subjective experience being there, there's a crispness, some objectivity to these boundaries, not a fuzzy boundary. So, you know, you hear Alan Watts talking about, we're all waves in the ocean of being, which is very poetic and beautiful, but waves don't have boundaries, right? Like, waves are kind of like very fuzzy. It's like, they're not gonna work as an explanatory framework to really address the boundary problem, right? Or, eddies or some, some abstract, fuzzy concept like that. We, we, we need actually something tangibly concrete and crisp and objective that actually separates us from the rest of reality. The second one is, yeah, the lower level boundary problem, um, right? It's like, my brain is made of tiny animals, right? It's like, why aren't we neurons, right? It's, it's a very puzzling thing. We seem to be like whole brains for some reason. Uh, the higher level problem is like, yeah, why aren't we the planet, Gaia, you know, the galaxy? Uh, the boundary, pro you know, the private boundary problem, this one's a little bit more conceptually tricky, but it's very important, which is like, okay, once we establish that we're at this scale, why is it that there's also subdivisions, right? Like, it could be that, hey, we exist at this scale, but we can read each other's minds or something like that. And as far as, 
you know, we know that's probably not the case. I, I, I'm not sure, but there, se there seems to be, at least on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, some level of privacy to our experiences. So that, that is also something you need to account for. And then also the temporal boundary problem. This one is a little bit conceptually tricky, but if you think about it, we're in a similar epistemic position to our future selves as we are to like other people, right? Like, I don't have direct introspective access to what I'm gonna be eating for lunch tomorrow, right? Unless I'm planning, but like, not, not the reality of it, or, or what I did like 10 minutes ago, right? In the same way, I don't have introspective access to what you're experiencing right now. It's a kind of like similar kind of like position. So, you know, we argue that, you know, from first principles, you can actually arrive at the conclusion that m moments of experience are discrete. Actually, there's like snapshots of experience one at a time, because if that wasn't the case, you would have introspective access to the future and to the past, right? Like there's some actual division that is happening and chopping us, you know, from one moment to the next. <laughs> and that would be the temporal boundary problem. There's like a, a couple like further, very important desiderata for, for a solution to the boundary problem. Uh, one of them is frame invariance. Um, you know, you want your solution to be something in the absolute, <laughs> something that like stands, you know, any frame of reference that is not specific to a particular frame of reference. Now, I know some people disagree with that. I know Nira has a papers precisely against that, but <laughs> this is something that we took very seriously within our, within our research. It's kind of a, a constraint for our solution. Um, Non-epiphenomenalism, right? Like, our boundaries must be useful for something. There's a reason why evolution selected, you know, the, the phenomenal boundaries that we have, or otherwise uh, it wouldn't be the way they are, right? Like, they seem to be causally significant, computationally significant, useful for something, right? So whatever solution to the boundary problem you have, it has to explain why, what is this boundary useful for? Um, and then like no strong emergence. So we're, we're not in the business of coming up with new physics. <laughs> you know, like the standard model, you know, 26, you know, digits of um, significant, you know, figures of precision tested in laboratories. We're not gonna go against physicists saying like, hey, the physics is wrong. Um, of course we can, you know, play with interpretations of physics. That's totally fine, right? Like we're not messing with kind of like new physics. Everything we're talking about is consistent with the standard model. Okay, so with all of that said, <laughs> we propose that at the very least the explanatory space where we find the solution to the boundary problem is in electromagnetic field topology. Okay, let me walk you through a little bit of kind of the, the reasoning behind this. So topological properties in the field might satisfy a lot of desirable criteria. So first of all, they're frame invariant. You know, whether there's a topological pocket in the field is not something that really depends on how you look at it. As long as you gather enough data, it doesn't matter the frame of reference. It either is there or it isn't. Um, Non-epiphenomenalism, I'll explain why, with hopefully compelling, compelling data and, um, and arguments. And no strong emergence. You know, like changes in the topology of the field require no modifications to the standard model, just actually are just implied by the standard. In fact, they're implied by Maxwell's equations. We don't even need to go to anything exotic here. Um, this is one of the key reasons why oftentimes, let's say, the electromagnetic field is invoked as a potential kind of like causal link in you know, conscious processing, which is local field potentials uh, have kind of like a um, more than the sum of the parts effects uh, in the nervous system. We, we heard from um, Earl K. Miller today, like a fantastic presentation about local field potentials and, and the electromagnetic field in the brain and the causal significance of brain waves. And there's a very simple core reason why local field potentials are more than the sum of the parts, which is that uh, cell walls actually function as a kind of low pass filter, right? So, so the activity that is going on in the local field potentials really does do something more than just the aggregate of the spikes of neurons. So, okay, like that's really interesting, but what I'm gonna, gonna point out is uh, hopefully, like it's, it's kind of like a, another wrinkle on this that, that, that kind of like might sell you the idea that electromagnetism is really significant. And that is that there is a causal circuit between topology and resonance that gives rise to holistic field behavior. And we think like this is the reason why evolution selected for boundaries, phenomenal boundaries, unified moments of experience is because when you have topological changes in the field, you also have resonance. You also have whole beings acting as a unit. So there's a little bit of a yeah, show and tell. Uh, just, this is just kind of to give you some, some uh, intuition. So, so, so here's like a clown balloon. Imagine you know, the, the field of consciousness is the surface of this balloon, roughly speaking. So a topological change would be something like taking both sides and twisting it, right? Like 
as I start twisting it, that's a difference in degree that eventually turns into a difference in kind, right? Like the moment you get the pinch point, this is a qualitatively different sort of object than before. Well, not exactly because it's not a mathematical, you know, like surface, but imagine for a moment in that, like, if you're a point in one of these uh, sides of the balloon and you want to be to the, go to the other side, you will have to go through this pinch point, right? And as you go through that pinch point, a lot of information gets lost, right? It's like all the information that this side gets from this side is through this zero dimensional point. There's, there's a collapse of kind of information transfer. This is really significant for information processing, for causal effects. Um, but then the other thing too, right, is um, kind of like this comes with unique vibrations. So let me, let me give you like some, some other examples. So um, I bet some of you attended the eclipse. Uh, I did, it was like really stunning. I was expecting it to be beautiful, but actually was really profound. And one of the things that was really profound about it was that you could actually see in plain sight the magnetic field of the sun. It was really trippy and crazy that, yeah, you know, it had this, like, this all additional structure to the sun that is really there that if you just block the sun, you can actually see in plain sight. And, you know, this is kind of like tracking plasma tubes and enormous amount of like matter moving around <laughs> these field lines. And here's the thing. This is a place where macroscopic topological changes to the electromagnetic field have clear, enormous causal effects. Where, like, I want to emphasize that, yes, like topological changes to the field are not epiphenomenal. They actually come with significant, significant implications at the causal level. In fact, you know, these, these are solar flares and um, coronal mass ejections, you know, like millions of tons of matter get expelled into outer space when you have this thing that is called magnetic reconnection happen to the field, which is how the field lines choose their partners. And in the right conditions, you know, when plasma tubes touch each other, the field lines like switch partners and that unleashes the plasma into outer space and it's just the, the enormous changes just through topology. Okay, so topology in fields is causally significant, right? There's a reason biology would be using it for something. Um, there's another picture. So here's kind of like, yeah, the, 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 the really juicy kind of like, you know, if you're, keep one thing from this presentation, try to kind of like think of this diagram, which is, you know, we just assume physical laws, completely standard physical laws. Um, weak causal emergence, nothing strange here, gives rise to topological segmentation. And then topological segmentation in the field, what we claim is that A creates um, things that are causally significant, such as like these resonances within the, top, the topological pocket. And B, it is a source of phenomenal boundaries. OK, so when you have this sort of causal structure, you know, it's not exactly that the phenomenal boundaries themselves you know, is, are, are having the causal effect. It's more that the topological segmentation is both causing phenomenal boundaries and something of computa that is computationally useful. OK. Um, and again, you know, the same with uh, kind of like balloons, right? Like the moment you have a topological segmentation and you make the balloon vibrate, each of the segments will have its own resonant modes, you know, depending on you know, the frequency at which you're vibrating and the shape of the balloon, you will get like different shapes. But the point is that imagine evolution would have a reason to use these sort of things, um, to encode information, to act as a unit, to kind of like coordinate large uh, scale uh, subsystems. Um, and really what it's kind of like all of this is an um, um, encouragement to start thinking topologically about consciousness and connecting it with resonance. I think there's a lot of juice in here. Um, you know, the field of uh, you know, investigating topology in physics is really, really nascent and really open. If you look at kind of citations on uh, topological analysis of the field, it's growing exponentially over the years. Uh, I think this is gonna be a big deal. And you, you can actually simulate, you know, like topological effects in uh, the electromagnetic field. These are some simulations from um, a wonderful website called falstad.com. I highly recommend playing with it. Uh, these are just some examples of um, you know, resonant modes in a, in a closed box of the electromagnetic field. And as you can see, you do have kind of this property of topolo topology emerging, where like field lines loop around. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, what we propose is that when you're awake, when you're a subject of experience, you, know, you actually have a phenomenal boundary. The brain is resonating in a particular way that is causing field lines to loop around and literally create an objective, crisp, causally significant boundary in the field that is defining who you are right now. 
And so we could actually look at the field and say, hey, this is it. Here's your visual field, here's your tactile field, and they're all connected through this topological structure. There's an objective amount of energy in it. You know, there's an objective amount of information. It's not a fuzzy thing. Um, and yeah, this is just kind of a, I, I added a couple, yeah, a couple of slides for people in the internet <laughs> to look at more closely uh, some of our arguments. Uh, but yeah, at a, at a very high level, that is like the, 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 the main takeaway. So again, when you're thinking of, okay, how, how the boundaries arise, you've got to think, what are the boundaries useful for? And what we claim is that they're useful because they have useful resonant modes that actually makes them act as a unit. You know, holism becomes <laughs> vindicated and compatible with the physics. Um, and uh, yeah, this is just kind of like a last slide to give you kind of uh, lingering thoughts, which is that, okay, we are like a pocket in the electromagnetic field. In some sense, you know, kind of like these ancient ideas of like, oh, maybe we're beings of light or something like that. They may not be that far off, actually. Like, if we're actually, you know, like energy trapped in the electromagnetic field, you could think of we're beings of light constrained by a manifold, by a shape of the field. And, you know, the flavors of your consciousness, of your emotions, of your being, have to do with the resonant modes of that shape. And so, you know, very poetically, <laughs> the reason, okay, a reason why we're all divided, we're not all one, why, like, God didn't choose to just be alone is because each shape produces a completely different music. So actually, you know, being a particular shape is adding a particularly, completely unique note to reality, which I think it's a, maybe a poetic ending to this. And uh, yeah, just for people who are curious about our next steps, and uh, that's it. Thank you very much, and uh, yeah, thank you the PRI team here. And questions? <laughs>